Hey everyone, I'm your host Anthony. We do content like this weekly, so hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified. If you want more content like this, click the like button and please leave a comment. Thanks again for watching. On today's episode of the Root Cause Medicine Podcast, my guest is Dr. Chris Miletus. Dr. Miletus is the clinical science educator at U.S. Biotech Laboratories, the educational consultant at Fairhaven Health, and scientific advisor at Trace Minerals Research Company. Among many other professional and advisor roles that Dr. Miletus holds, he was the dean and chief medical officer at the National College of Natural Medicine for seven years and has authored 18 books and over 200 nationally published articles included on PubMed database. You can find more about Dr. Miletus at www.drmiletus.com. Dr. Miletus, welcome to the show. It's such a pleasure to have you here today. It's an honor, actually, to know what work you're doing and how much knowledge you're sharing with patients and providers. Hey, it's an honor. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. You know, Dr. Miletus, you are an authority on environmental and food allergens. This is really important. So I want to pick your brain today in this area. And I really do think a lot of people are going to appreciate this conversation. You know, today's world, we are so blessed to have access to so many resources and helpful information to improve our health. But we also now live in this world where I almost feel like everything is trying to kill us. You know, sometimes I feel like we're in that uh, we're going to wake up and be in that Indiana Jones movie. I think it's called the temple of doom. And he's running across a bridge, having to dodge all the booby traps everywhere. And so it can be pretty scary, but all jokes aside, you know, there's so many things in our environment that can be harmful to our health really now more than ever in our lifetimes. In fact, we have food that's genetically modified. We have cities that have more smog and air pollution than ever before. And we have things like plastics and other chemicals all around us. I actually think there was a study in 2004, which I, I can't believe was actually 20 years ago at this point, or almost, that said the average Roman is exposed to nearly 200 different chemicals every single day. And that was almost 20 years ago. So this is pretty crazy. And uh, before we get started and get into the meat of this conversation, though, our listeners really need to know some important things regarding allergens, because there's just so much confusion out there. So I really want to set the stage here so our listeners understand that there's actually different kinds of allergic reactions that can happen in the body. So can you please explain for everybody the difference is in allergens out there, specifically the immediate versus delayed types of allergens that can be found? Awesome question and an important question. So over the last 29 years, I share with my patients the three big ones. There's IgE, and think of IgE for emergency room, it's anaphylaxis. I got stung by a bee, I ate an egg or a peanut and I'm blowing up, I can't breathe. That's immediate reactions. And that's the true allergies that the allopathic MD community says, hey, that's an allergy. Then there's sensitivities. And the two big ones I do in my clinical practice and invariably together is IgG and IgA. And I'll explain those two. So IgG, just like I said, E is for emergency room. Those are anaphylactic. I'd say G is for gradual. Think of G for gradual. You can eat a food today. You're like, okay, well, I ate the same food yesterday and I felt okay, but now I'm feeling really crummy. Two or three days ago, that food, much like a sneaker wave, could come up and get you. And so it's a stacking effect. So if I or you or the audience eats an IgG food, the half-life is 21 days, which means it's still going on and only half of the reaction is gone within 21 days. So like, okay, when we're trying to play detective, how do I even remember two days ago what I ate, let alone three days or a week ago? It's like, okay, well, I ate that food and I ate it again the next Saturday, then the next Saturday, and that stacking effect is occurring. That's why we do IgG food sensitivity testing. And that can cause all kinds of symptoms, which I'm sure you and I will chat about. So there's IgE, the immediate emergency ones, anaphylaxis, true allergies. There's IgG food sensitivities. Then there's IgA. And IgA is interesting because that's our mucous membranes, our eyes, nose, throat, lungs, GI tract, and female reproductive regions. And so we got any symptoms in that area, the runny nose, the scratchy eyes, always do IgA. So we normally IgG, the gradual ones, 
There's more immunoglobulin, and we've learned a lot about immunoglobulins. Um, I, you started out with how overwhelming the world is. Well, we've my patients suffer from a condition called Googleitis. They've Googled things to the point where like, okay, too much information. Um, indeed, as Dorothy was, I'm going to quote, you quoted a peer-reviewed journal article. I'm going to quote Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz. We're no longer in Kansas. We live in a much more toxic world than we have ever thought. And I'm half Greek, half German. And I'm thinking about Hippocrates, 400 BCE. And he walked around in the Mediterranean sun. He spent too much time there. He might get burnt. He ate out of a fairly organic ocean, 400 BCE. And when he didn't feel well, he came home. His wife says, oh, you don't feel well, eat. Oh, food is my medicine. Those were the good old days. And now we have toxins and pollutants and human made um, you know, problems in our world. And so, so we got the IgE, we got the IgG, the IgA, and all of these are potential burdens. But as we learned with the COVID era, now my patients know about IgG and IgM. Before, that wasn't a big conversation. We, when we did a test, we explained what IgG and IgM was. And, but now they're like, oh, but, but I, how about this? And how about that? So our bodies make all these defense mechanisms to determine friend versus foe. The biggest foe, the most immediate foe is the IgE. That's the anaphylaxis, that's true allergies. Then the IgG and IgA are a total burden, the proverbial straw in the camel's back. It's like someone putting a pebble, as I described to my patients, in your backpack on a long hike, and they're totally trolling you. Here's one more pebble, and here's more and more. All of a sudden, boy, this backpack's getting really heavy. That's your total food burden. And then you're like, I don't think I feel well. And it's that all of a sudden, a nudge, 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 and all of a sudden, you tip over. No, that is so important. I'm, I'm glad that you covered the really big foundation for that, for this discussion today. And as you mentioned, there's so many different types of allergens and these immunoglobulins um, in our bodies, um, but allergens in our environment that you, that you just mentioned. But how does this impact the body as a whole? How do all of these, I know you, you talked a little bit about IgE, as this is when you're going to the emergency room, this is very immediate. And then some of the delayed ones, these sensitivities. But as a whole, are these uh, different types of allergens and sensitivities affecting particular organs more than others or different areas of the body? Yeah, and so the IgE, you think mostly airways, systemic reactions, and I identify as an IgE person. I got my EpiPen right next to me, and I got one in my car, and I got one wherever I travel. I want my travel go bag, and that's a inject yourself with epinephrine. And so that's usually mu mucous membranes, that's your circulatory system, and that's everything closing down on you. You're being suffocated and alive, and you have this huge inflammatory response. But all of these, the IgE, which is a, a true allergy, then we have the IgG and IgA, th these are all things that are going to trigger cytokines. Another word our patients now know, and all of us doctors know more than ever, inflammatory burden. And so it's causing us to be more inflamed. So um, as we started chatting today, I mentioned that our whole family has been dealing with whatever little creeping crud's been going around. So an inflamed brain is a less clear brain. And so think, in, or a joint, or as we talk as docs, you and I and our audience, the total amount of itises you have. So I got some sinusitis, I got conjunctivitis, I got tonsillitis, I got bronchitis, I got some arthritis, and all these itises contribute to your total inflammatory burden. So just like your food sensitivities, your food allergies, all of these things are basically turning up the temperature just a little bit on the back burner until you get to that rolling boil. And you're like, oh, I've got a mess. And that's what we call symptoms, right? Before that, okay, I'm limping along. I don't feel real great, but I don't feel real bad. And so that rolling boil is eating all of these foods. And so it, we all have susceptibilities. So if maybe if you're, if you're in high school or college and you did a sport, I, I twisted my ankle in gymnastics, or I really tweaked my knee in rugby or soccer. And now when you misstep, you kind of feel that flare up. Those are the, those old injuries or going back to my Greek heritage, Achilles was dipped into the river Styx by his mom and the Achilles tendon, your Achilles um, heel. It's like, okay, well, what's your weak spot? We all have our weak spots. So if you and I get a cold, mine might hit my sinuses and my lungs. Somebody else might hit their ear. And they always have, even as adults, they have like, boy, my ear is kind of full and congested. But other people, it hits their gut. Like 
the l- latest little bug going around, like, oh, my tummy doesn't feel well. So knowing that you were all our own coal miners canary. And for most of the audience, which will be younger than me, they probably don't know what a coal miner's canary is. And I've never seen a coal miner's canary except in a picture. But the coal miners would actually used to take these poor little canaries in a cage into the coal mines. And if they fell off their perch, it was time for the miner to get out because the coal miner's canary was more susceptible to poor air quality. This was before all our high fancy tech that we have today. It's like, hmm, so your different parts of our bodies are our coal miner's canary. It might be like, boy, my joints really hurt or I'm really congested. So yeah, the signs and symptoms vary from person to person. And it might be brain fog. It might be a mood change. It might be like, well, I'm really feeling anxious or it might be stimulation of the most important, in my opinion, of all our cranial nerves, cranial nerve number 10. And cranial nerve number 10. So we have 12 cranial nerves. We've all gone to the eye doctor and she will tell you, don't move your head, follow the H in space. Well, you and I know that they're measuring cranial nerves. They test our hearing, they're measuring a cranial nerve. If we stick our tongue out, which of course we won't do on a Zoom call, that's cranial nerve number 12. But cranial nerve number 10, the vagal nerve, 80% plus of it's sensory. And so it's all going down as you and I know but it goes past our heart, our esophagus. It is telling us how, what's going on in that tummy? What's going on in the rest of the body? And see, if you think of the word vagabond, a wanderer, not all people that wander are lost. We've seen that bumper sticker before. But that nerve is saying, I wonder how things are doing. But now we got food sensitivities, food allergies, and that's going to trigger anxiety, depression, leaky gut, leaky brain, and it can cause flip-flops, heart palpitations, called Romheld syndrome, which was discovered by a German doc. And it all talks about anxiety, depression, fibromyalgia, all related to that lovely little vagal nerve, which can be messed up from IgE, IgG, or IgA. Dr. Melissa, I love your stories and your analogies. They're so helpful for people to understand this. And as you mentioned, you talked about this inflammatory loading. You just mentioned some conditions that people can start to actually develop once they their symptoms begin to progress. So uh, as you're mentioning, and, and there's so many people suffering with different diagnoses that they've been given, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Even prior to uh, going to, you know, uh, or having ex- experienced symptoms for a long time prior. So um, can you really dive into a little bit deeper these other health conditions that can actually develop as a result of being around these allergens for prolonged periods of time and how this impacts the immune system? Certainly. And I know we're going to probably talk later on today about foods we eat and the inhaled substance we inhale and how we become the cream of the Oreo cookie. And so what's interesting is all of we have that susceptibility, that proverbial Achilles heel, that you know weakness we have. And then what happens is our tissues become chronically inflamed. So imagine, and I'm going to give a silly but true example. I have a dust allergy. It's true. I've ever had, ever had it since I was a kid. And, um, but now what should I not consume as a supplement because of my dust mite allergy? And I'm going to use allergy and sensitivity interchangeable here because I'm not differentiating. But so I have this, this susceptibility to, well, I should not have glucosamine sulfate. I should not have chondroitin sulfate. And I definitely should not eat crab, lobster, or shrimp. Like, whoa, how did you make that connection? Well, dust mites are crustacea. Have you ever looked in our microscope or you Google dust mites? And if the audience is doing that now, I'm like, oh, gross. And they're on your bed, by the way, and your pillow and on you. And you and I know that, but like, okay, I was better before I knew that. Once again, the, the, the problem with Google or Safari or whatever browser you choose to use or DuckDuckGo, if you're on the progressive side of like, eh, I don't want to be tracked. So, you're, so now you're doing this little thing and you're like, Okay, well, that kind of looks like a miniature microscopic shrimp or a lobster or crab. And so you know, that cross-reactivity in glucosamine and chondroitin are often derived from shellfish. So why would I be, you know, all of a sudden like, oh, wow, yeah, I noticed that. Mary Jo was doing really great, but normally I do glucosamine and chondroitin, but I remember she has really bad hay fever and allergies. And every time she does that deep spring cleaning, she comes in miserable to my office. Yeah, now I gave her glucosamine, well-intentioned, or a chondroitin, and uh, boy, she's like, I don't think I'm doing very well with that supplement. 90% of the time, you and I are giving glucosamine, chondroitin, or something like that, or for gut health, N-acetyl glucosamine for a leaky gut. 
also crustacea derived, unless we got a vegan form of it. And it's like, hmm, we just actually caused them to flare. So it will be that arthritis flare, the sinus flare. And this is where if it's a mucous membrane, eyes, nose, throat, lungs, GI tract, or female reproductive region, then we're looking at, ah, is it IgG, the gradual, or is it IgA? And whenever there's a mucous membrane, and the way I describe mucous membranes, think of the inside of our cheek, and then think of the, that's how our whole inside of our body is. Whereas outside of our skin is keratinized. So same things inside of our cheek, and you and I know from a histology class. But it's like, okay, but it doesn't have the tough outer part, and that's the inside of our cheek. So all our IgA mucous membranes, you think about wherever you got the soft, mushy spots, which starts here and goes all the way through. And it's like, hmm, okay, IgA food. So we want to do an IgA panel. But now the G foods, the IgG immunoglobulins, those are interesting because they trigger a pathway that you and I know well called complement. And not, not complementary, like I like your shirt, but complement with an E. And it actually triggers inflammation. And so it triggers this cascade of inflammation. So now imagine we have the dust allergy, um, you have a plant, the person in the next um, cubicle to you is wearing a perfume that kind of tickles your nose. And all of a sudden you get to that threshold of ha chew. And whenever our body makes mucus or our eyes water, or we eat wrong food, exit strategies in one way or the other, it's, a exit, it's how we survive. We protect ourselves. But when we create mucus, we know we've irritated the body and the body's trying to quench what I will term very medically a boo-boo. You got an owie and you're putting a slime mucus on it. So I inhale pollen, I'm trying to wash it out and I'm trying to cover up those mucus memories because I'm inflamed. So usually mucus and inflammation go hand in hand. It's very interesting. Thank you for, for going down and explaining that Dr. Melitis. And I think the real issue is that so many people are experiencing those types of symptoms and diagnoses and they're never correlating it with the foods that they're exposed to, with the environmental uh, allergens, the inhalants, and all these other things in our environment. So, so thank you for explaining that. That makes more sense. And as you mentioned, Dr. Melitis, yes, the next thing I want to talk about is these foods, all right? So let's, let's break this topics down a little bit further. So most people have heard of being gluten-free or even dairy-free these days. And also, if if you're a guy listening to this, a little side note, and if you've been wanting to try gluten-free beer, you know, your friends might make fun of you a little bit at first, but don't worry. Once you try it, once they try it for themselves, they, they might have a newfound opinion on it. So promise gluten-free beer is not as bad as, as your friends might make it out to be. But uh, Dr. Melitis, can you give us some real insight into how these foods like gluten and dairy and others can be a problem for somebody? And, and then again, those, some of those conditions that can develop as a result. Yes. And on the beer note, it's time to hop on the hops. So and we got all these microbrews. I'm from Oregon, microbrew capital of the world, or at least our state. We're very, it's like, oh, I'm going for this micro. Eh, so maybe we're going to go back to those old German monasteries where they made the water cleaner and safer by do, doing their beers. Um, but eh, maybe we go hops, or as we would say in Latin, humilis. Um, Got to love the hops unless you're allergic to it, which once again, or sensitive to it. So that's why you want to do a food sensitivity panel. But um, so the, the concept is that, let's say gluten, there's overt celiac disease, as we know, and you can do a celiac panel to see, do you have celiac disease? Or in the conventional GI world, they're going to say, let's go ahead and do a biopsy of you and see whether or not you have celiac disease. And in the conventional world, if you've been gluten-free or the audience has been gluten-free, I want to see if I have celiac disease. I'm going to go down, get scoped, have a little pinch of tissue and see whether they actually will tell you, eat some gluten beforehand for a protracted period of time to get that reactivity. And with the true celiac or gluten, of course, we know the big issue is we get malabsorption syndrome. And a silly little example, but if you were to think of my fingers as the villi of our small intestine, now all of a sudden, this is a healthy small intestine. I have all these areas where I can absorb vitamins, B12, zinc, minerals. But now with celiac disease, you get these little nubbits. So your little villi becomes short and there's much less area to absorb. So you can have celiac disease or you can have gluten intolerance and gluten intolerance can mirror this. And I actually gave a lecture on this topic about non-celiac gluten intolerance, which actually can even lead to psychosis. Actually, if we were to all, once again, Google, but now we're going to go to Google, we're going to PubMed.gov. 
We go pubmed.gov and type in gluten psychosis, pubmed.gov for the um, patients listening that aren't familiar. That is where it's a medical library. You can access a lot of medical journals, but be warned, it is not rated for peace of mind or harmony or feel good. It will just give you the facts in a very scientific way. So if you're anxious, don't go to pubmed.gov. I'll just tell you that. And But it's like you type in gluten psychosis and like, wow, there's articles about non-celiac patients and they eat gluten and they go, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. It's like, once again, a trigger. So is it neuroinflammation? Is it gut? And so with that said, with celiac disease or gluten sensitivity, we have casein and there's believed to be a cross-reaction with dairy and gluten or gliatin. And so now the question is I'm gluten-free, but now I feel poorly. Maybe I got a cross-contamination in the kitchen. Maybe I got a cross-contamination someplace and, or you got a cross-reactive food. And remember, wheat is a grass and you have other grasses. Could there be a cross-reactivity there? Or could it be that, hey, well, I'm gluten-free, gliatin-free, microbrew-free, I'm only going hopsy. And, and all of a sudden, like, hmm, well, why do I feel punky? Gluten is just one of the many culprits. And could there be other things that are, once again, doing a humdinger? And this is where pollen.com comes in. I do my disclaimer, I do not work for pollen.com. But if you want to know for ourselves as practitioners or as a patient, well, why do I always feel crummy? And my smartest doctor in my life that I live with, is my wife. She's not a doctor, but she doctors me all the time. She has infinite wisdom with the wise woman. And she says, okay, Chris, no, it's March and April. No, you don't have lung cancer. Okay. Talk me off the cliff, Chris, you don't, you're not going blind. We've gone to the eye doctor every year around this time, but it's birch season here in Oregon. So the white little bark tree and the little worms, I call them worms, the little pollen pods and the tree, uh, all of a sudden your car, no matter what color it is, is now lime green. And well, guess what? Birch trees cross-react with carrots, hazelnuts, filberts, which Oregon is very well known for, celery, soy, and apples. But So what don't I want to eat during birch season? Those foods and a list of other foods from a cross-reactivity perspective, because now I am the cream of the Oreo cookie. I'm inhaling it. I'm eating it. And my poor little mucous membranes are in the middle of a tug of war argument that I don't want to be in. So I found that out, oh, maybe a decade ago, we went to the Oregon coast. We went to a chocolatier place, which made fresh chocolate right there while you're watching it. And they put hazelnuts in. I'm coming. My mouth is a little itchy. The roof of my mouth, is, my throat's a little scratchy. Luckily, it wasn't the IGE emergency room, but it was making me a little nervous. I said, oh, there's hazelnuts there. Oh, it is birch season, isn't it? So pollen.com, you can identify with your zip code wherever you are, what pollens are problematic. And it's like, okay, well, you know, I'm flaring up a little bit. So then you go to pollen.com like, oh, I'm gonna avoid those cross-reactive foods because apparently I go outside, I go for a walk or a run and okay, I'm not gonna eat those foods that are related to those pollens. So it's empowering. I love that. And the cross-reactivity factor that you brought into play is so important between all these different types of foods and food groups that most people are unaware of, Dr. Merlita. So what about chemicals in our, in our environment, like plastics and even furniture? We know that there's flame retardants in most furniture, and there's that terrible chemical in many plastics called the BPA. Uh, I want to have that, that dun, dun, dun. It's a terrible oh, chemical, one, 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 yes. but it really is so damaging to the body. So how can people become reactant to these things and develop allergies? Because we know a lot of these are also endocrine disruptors. Yeah. So they're definitely xenoestrogens as they're called or endocrine disruptors. And we're all hormonal creatures. And so we know that male fertility is dropped by about two thirds from the 1930s. We know that couple fertility has dropped tremendously. There's 12 to 15 million infertile couples in the United States alone. And it's usually about 50% or 40% uh, the male, 40% the female. Then there's that, always that overlap of a weak fertility and a weak fertility makes a combined weak fertility. And so the question is we are we got the BPA, bisphenol A. And one of the things which we do in our office is we spend extra money for our patients. And you're like, what do you mean you spend extra money for? We get BPA-free 
credit card receipts, so, you know, the paper, because you can buy the cheap ones, which are shiny, which have more BPA in them, or you can spend an extra couple of dollars for a roll and get BPA free. And when you go to now with COVID era, you're like, oh my goodness, I've just got all these germs. I'm going to put some hand sanitizer on that drives the BPA in faster and deeper. Like, oh no, I was feeling good. Well, we will have a special on Prozac or maybe St. John's word at the end of this, this joking. Um, but it's, it can become very overwhelming. And this is once again, how you do your vagal nerve. You need to be calm. So you listen to Mozart and you're like, Chris, okay, we went from BPA to Mozart. Where are you going with this? If you Google Mozart eczema, Mozart allergies, actually Mozart actually helps with allergies. Like what? It's actually in the medical literature. Dr. Kamadik did this, but now allergies, very good. But the other thing on the random side of things, rub in your earlobes stimulates the vagal nerve. In fact, of course, there's units that do the vagal nerve. So calm, digestion, and we all know when we're stressed, we're not digesting. And this is going to come back to the chemicals, I promise. And so what's interesting is we need to all be pooing two to three times a day. That's having a stool, having a bowel movement, more medical terms. And for those ICD-10 oriented people, I don't know that code, but I know it's not a Z code. Okay, so um, that's an insurance joke, by the way. Um, but so now it's like, irritable bowel, irritable bowel. But now all of us know about the Bristol stool chart. And if not, B-R-I-S-T-O-L. And you know, we, there's a one through seven on the Bristol stool chart. Number one is the hard little moose poo. And then it goes to a lumpier, bumpier poo and then kind of a, a tough squish poo. And then we have what I call the Costco hot dog, the Frankfurter, the ballpark park Frank. And once again, have no ownership of any of those. Don't even have Costco stock. I wish I did. Um, so, but now if you have a dryer poo, what happened to all that moisture? And as I gently tell my patients, hmm, well, a six and a seven's wet poo. And we know where the moisture went. It went into the commode, the toilet. Well, what happened to all the moisture on the dry poo? Well, you have reabsorbed all that muddy water and the xenoestrogens, the BPA, the phthalates the parabens. And one of my patients, because unfortunately my patients become geeks like I am, and they say, oh, Dr. Melitas, take a look at this picture. And they say, this is a pie at the local store. I won't mention the store. And it has three parabens in the glaze. They actually list the parabens, which are endocrine disruptors in the shiny glaze on the apple pie. Why? Because it's a preservative. Well, it will preserve us, much like formaldehyde. Well, or maybe we can go to aspartame and a whole other conversation. So BPA, the phthalates, the parabens, all are disturbing your my essence, you and me as hormonal creatures, the audience as hormonal creatures. And this is how we adapt to the world. We know that there's a condition called IMS, irritable male syndrome. You can it's Googleable, IMS. So just like there's PMS, there's IMS. Because we're hormonal creatures again. And so all of a sudden it's like, wow, these are binding on to the receptors and I have the benefit of living in Oregon along a coast. But if you know what a sea anemone is, you go along to a little tide pool, there's a little sea anemone. And by the nature of sea anemone, if it gets a little you know, food in it, it'll go and it'll close. And so now the thing is we don't wanna be pushing our receptors all day long artificial with human made chemicals and we are. And so this is why I like to do an organic acid with an environmental pollutant panel. And because I want to know how much phthalate, how many parabens. And as we enter the holiday season, we have two issues. The topic of the day, am I going to eat my food allergies? So you get together with Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Christmas, New Year celebration, whatever it might be. And you're like, oh, every time I get together with my family, I'm in a bad mood. Is it that white dinner roll that's getting you? Or is it Uncle Joe next to you? or, or um, Uncle Bob over here, or you know, whatever, or Aunt Sally. And so it's like, hmm. So it could be the food you're eating because you're eating naughty foods relative to what you normally eat. Or maybe it's a cranberry. I only have cranberry during Thanksgiving. And lo and behold, you have a food sensitivity to cranberry. Um, so the chemicals that we're eating, we need to quantify them. But now I go through the holidays, I gain weight, as many people do. And then you make the New Year's resolution and you lose weight and you lose a pound or two pounds of fat. Well, all those BPAs, phthalates, parabens, xenoestrogens, the endocrine disruptors, which mean hormone disruptors, they're now stored in your fat. Now, all of a sudden, you're releasing all those toxins, and you have to make sure you're detoxing. So 
knowing the foods and in the buffet of life, getting a food sensitivity test. I like a 208 panel personally myself, because I want to know not only the foods that are bad for me, but I want to, okay, this one's okay. It has a low score, but also the herbs. So imagine, you know, one of the, my friendly um, herbs is turmeric, part of my daily regime. I give it to my patients all the time for inflammation. And it's like, hmm, I added turmeric to my potatoes. Is it the potatoes or is it the turmeric that's the issue? That's very, very interesting. Uh, I, I love how you talked about some of these things that we just really can't avoid, as you mentioning, um, you, you know, again, some of the BPA and the, and the parabens and all these things, but also the natural ways that we can also mitigate them, such as stimulating that vagus nerve, that parasympathetic mm -hmm. state. And as you said, one of the easiest ways is either listening to Mozart, rubbing the ears, other things for those listeners, things like deep belly breathing really helps to stimulate that vagus nerve. And is vagus, uh, it's not spelled like Las Vegas, just in case you're wondering, it's, it's <laughs> V-A-G-U-S. So, so just, you know, people always, oh, Las Vegas nerve. Yeah. So uh, however you want to remember that, but very helpful tools help stimulate that. And you talked about testing, Dr. Melissa, and I'm going to get into that in just a second. But Let's move on to inhaled particles and chemicals. And you, you talked about pollen a little bit already, but there's a lot of other things we're exposed to. Uh, dust, pet hair, mold, even gasoline, which is pretty crazy. And, and I have to actually tell you a funny story, Dr. Melitis. Uh, I have a friend and I actually kind of feel bad for him. He loves dogs, right? He's a huge dog lover. And he always talked about having a dog, uh, having a dog in it now that he's an adult because he had ones growing up. And so I have gone to the dog shelter with him more than mm -hmm. once. Uh, and I swear every time we go, he starts sneezing and tearing up because he's actually allergic to the pet hair, to the dogs. Uh, but he wants one so bad. So he just deals with it and he still tries to pet them all the time. And so it's so sad to watch, but this is a perfect example of the in different types of inhaled particles and chemicals all around us. So can you tell us a little bit more about these types of, of inhaled particles that so many people are exposed to and how people can also develop allergies from that or sensitivities? Wow. Um, so he's tearing up because he's emotional and allergic. That's sad. Exactly. Um, and my wife has cats and I have a cat allergy, but I love my wife enough to have allergies to cats. Um, so what's interesting is a dog and or indoor outdoor cat is a double whammy because you can have the cat or dog fur allergy um, or saliva in the case of cats. But in addition, what do the, all dogs that I know go outside? That's how they get their business done. Plus dogs by nature usually like outside. And, but now what happens is they have pollen that lands on them. They come inside, you pet them, you stir the pollen off them. Then you rub your nose, eat your food, or they sleep with you. And they're wonderful sleeping companions. But guess what? They brought the outdoors inside on their lovely fur, which makes them wonderful, lovely little companions. So we get a double whammy there. And so you can see I have where my three little monkeys are, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil on top of my air filter. And it's like, I run that constantly because I have food sensitivities. I have environmental sensitivities. And when I open up my window the, during bird season, actually my arm will turn red from where the fan is blowing pollen onto me. I'm a sensitive kind of guy and pun intended. And so it's like, hmm. So no, the environmental side of things, so this is why we like to do an environmental panel, which includes molds, meldews, cats, dogs, and on a random piece of trivia. So imagine your friend also liked cats. And so he goes to a friend's house, maybe your house, and you have a cat. And he goes, boy, I'm my, he's teary again, because of course he saw you, so he's very emotional about that. Oh no, I forgot, he has a cat allergy. And now what do you not want to serve him? Ham, pork, or bacon. Why? Because cat sensitivity and pork sensitivity cross-react. Those little things. So like, okay, if you know a person has a cat allergy, you have cats, but the person loves you enough to come visit you, it's like, eh, don't feed them dead pig. That would be a bad idea. Um, and that could actually go as far as protomorphogens and pig-derived you know, products. And maybe even as far as some of the thyroids, which are pig derived. So 
maybe you need to redirect me on this one because otherwise I'm going to go down a rabbit trail. So we we're talking about inhaled chemicals, which of course alter us, make us more susceptible. We have our inhaled food sensitivity or inhaled um, pollens and dogs and so forth. And that cross meshes with what's absorbing through our GI tract. So, but after that, I'll be on a rabbit trail. So real me and doc. No, absolutely. This is, this is such good information, Dr. Melitis. As you've been discussing, I think it, the real take home here is that you can be exposed to things like pet hair, dander, dust, pollen, mold, and even again, things like gasoline. Whether these things are natural or not in our environment, they can still cross react with other areas of the body. So let's jump into testing now. And you've talked about testing a little bit. And it sounds like that is the easiest way for someone to know exactly what they're exposed to and also what they could be cross reacting with. As you were mentioning, you might eat uh, a food or, or be exposed to a certain inhaled chemical, and that in chemical actually will cross react with a specific food that you may have no clue about. So, what specific tests? can identify all these different exposures to the foods, inhaled particles, even the beauty care chemicals that are just so rampant uh, everywhere in society. Yeah. So let's go to the chemicals to start with. You mentioned, of course, gasoline. So you start thinking um, toluene. And one of the interesting things with all the forest fires we've had in Oregon and California, Pacific Northwest and elsewhere in the country is pollution does not have geographical boundaries. We have states, we have cities, we have countries, but hey, the air is global, just like acid rain and pollution. So even if you're in a pristine environment, that doesn't mean down the road, there's not a, a smelting factory or a wood pulp factory that's dumping the perchlorate on you. And of course, we know like in New Jersey, New York, lots more breast cancer because of these things. Um, so life is a buffet, but we don't have really a choice of what air we breathe. Sure, I got my air filter, but I can control my little 10 by 10 room or whatever it is. But the moment I walk out my door and outside or to my car with all the off gassing or to the store. And if you've ever gone to a big box store, something like, OK, I'm walking my way out of here. This is a toxic store um, and not, not you know, probably chemically toxic, a little or a toxic store relative to the kind of store it is. And it's like, hmm. So you want to control things. So by testing in the buffet of life, you know what to avoid or not. So simple things like shower gels. Lots of parabens in those shower gels, even ones that you get from a, a health food store, like, oh, they throw in methyl paraben, they throw in another paraben, or sometimes it's kind of hidden under fragrance, unless you know it's an essential oil, it's hidden there. So you've been nice warm shower, unless you're into cold showers, and you're going ahead and you're slathering yourself, your skin's all nice and pink, and your pores are open and you're absorbing all those toxins. Or you have a hot beverage, we, we most of us know, don't drink hot things or microwave or cook things in plastic because of course it's going to leach the chemicals in or boy i'm really thirsty i have that bottle of water that's been in my back seat all summer but yeah don't drink it you know it tastes funky it, it is funky and you're going to absorb the the phthalates from the warm water you drink even if it's been chilled now or maybe the plastic water that's been on a las vegas um loading dock and you're at a conference like I bet it cooked for a few hours there in 120 degree in tarmac someplace. And so we want to do the food sensitivity. So allergies, IgE all day long. If you know you have an allergy, true allergy to an IgE, you want to quantify them and avoid them. Then we have the IgG and IgA. Life is a buffet. And before COVID, we had a, a restaurant around here called Sweet Tomatoes. It was a large salad bar. It's closed. It's permanently closed. They were out of business, big national chain. But I would know, okay, well, I'm not going to eat egg. I'm not going to put crumbled little hard boiled egg on my salad because I have an egg allergy or sensitivity. So, and I'm not going to put chickpeas on them either because even though that might be a source of protein, not my thing. So I, I can now go through the buffet, literally of the salad bar and pick friend or foe. And or consciously say, no, I really want to eat beets. I want to bump up my nitric oxide. And yes, I know I'm going to feel punky, but boy, I have lots of nitric oxide. I would have went for no beets personally because I don't like beets, but the benefits of nitric oxide. And so it gives us a buffet. Now, when it comes to total burden and chemicals, so we got the IgG and IgA 208 panel, which I like to do on all my patients. 95% of my patients get the combo. And then we go ahead and do an organic acid and an environmental pollutant panel. 
And the EPP can be done alone. It can measure the toluenes, benzenes, phthalates, and so forth and tell you what your total burden is. And now if you're going to, you and I are going to work on a patient, we're going to have them lose weight and they're going to meet their new year's resolution. They're going to join the CrossFit gym slowly and carefully so they don't injure themselves. And they're going to be losing weight while well, we're going to ask them to sweat. We're going to say, oh, we need to support the liver to support phase one and phase two detox and the infamous phase three, the babbling brook, pooing two to three times a day. Cannot overemphasize that as a naturopathic doctor. We got to be pooing. And anybody that's ever had a kid, you know, you feed them, they go potty and you get to clean it up. And so that's called gastrocolic reflex. We override that. We write, override that in elementary school and high school. You know, you know, the first stall as you're walking to the bathroom is always the empty stall. No one's going to choose to use that stall. It's like over there in the corner where, you know, get some privacy. And but it's like, okay, we override that. So we're not pooing as well. We're not drinking as much water because I mean, we have to go potty more often. So we're, we become this toxic milieu of a civilized adulthood. And so we need to have phase one, phase two, but phase three, pooing two to three times a day and lots of fiber, good, healthy microbiome. But then the organic acid po um, profile, the OAP, measures how your mitochondria is doing. So we got our carbs, our fats, and our proteins, and they all go into that thing that we all had to learn as doctors, that citric acid Krebs cycle, which makes ATP, which fuels our detox, fuels our healing of our gut, fuels our ability to deal with the toxins of the world. But as we get older, our ATP levels drop. So when you're 30, you make about 60 kilograms of ATP per day. Wow. So for those that are metrically challenged, that's about 125, 130 pounds a day of ATP for every decade. So I'm 56. So I, all things being equal, I'm 26% lower than a 30 year old. I'm making energy. Well, time to being old and just decrepit, which brings us to another Greek um, quote and piece of wisdom. What walks on four legs, then two legs at noon, three legs in the evening and no legs at night. Humankind. So you crawl, you walk, you amble with a cane, and then game over. And so have to do a shout out to the Greek heritage. Um, it's great to be ethnic centric because we all should have pride of where we came from, which comes to the whole concept. Are we eating unto our genes? Whole nother conversation for another day. Um, so it's like, hmm. So we want to support detox. We want to create a babbling brook versus a stagnant pond. Where does disease and mosquitoes grow? Stagnant ponds. So this is why you want your bowels to be a babbling brook. Um, so organic acid, environmental pollutant panel with the EPP, environmental pollutant. So you know your toxins. So you know what your burden is. Then if you lose weight, you're going to be exercising. You know, I'm going to support the liver. I'm going to give some glycine, some glutathione, things that your healthcare provider will tell you what to do relative to that test. And it's like, wow, it's very empowering. Plus, you know, that's been the missing special sauce of why every time you work out or you lose weight, you get itchy, you know, you know, all these little things, your body's talking to us. So that's uh, so important. Thank you so much for, for going over these different types of tests. And as you mentioned, it sounds like you're not only wanting to check uh, different panels related to the food sensitivities and allergies, like the IgG, the IgA, even the IgE if necessary, but also those environmental pollutants, uh, pollutants that are very common in, in our day and age. And then also even looking at our mitochondria, which are energy producing inside of our cells in the body and how that's related to all of these other allergens and sensitivities that can go on. So let's say somebody does all of these tests, Dr. Miletus, and finds out what they're allergic to, what they're sensitive to. What are the next steps for that person? Do they just have to not eat these foods, not ex be exposed to these particles or these chemicals ever again in their body. What let's give us some, uh, some insight into this. Are they allowed to eat those foods ever again? Cause I know, again, you tell somebody that they can't eat pizza and they love to eat pizza. Well, it's, it's going to be a, a hard time for them, uh, to do that. I think. Yes. And we're telling them they can't have microbrews. They have to go gluten free on their exactly. beers. Um, so hope we all want hope. And we want to hope that we can change our body. So if a person is taking lots of antibiotics, they've had gut issues going on, we can work on leaky gut syndrome. And I give this simple example of a colander that you would have in your kitchen where you strain your steamed vegetables or your noodles or your rice. If you have large holes in your colander, you've got lots of things that are going to go down the drain. So you want to have a healthy gut. 
So if you take an antibiotics, you don't have good microbiome, friendly bacteria, probiotics like acidophilus, bifidobacterium, then you want to go ahead and build up your gut. But then there's three kinds of sensitivities that I describe it for my patients. This is what I call a criticism. There's fixed allergens or sensitivities, earned and cross-reactives. We talked about cross-reactives a little bit. So the fixed ones, when I did my food sensitivity, I have two um, adult boys, sons, and one of them is identical to me in terms of food sensitivities. He's the luck of the draw, the genetic behind the eight ball. He could thank dad for being messed up, probably in multiple reasons, but for sure food sensitivities. And so as a result, he has a lot of the same reactions. And But when he avoids them, they go down. So part of it's fixed. He's susceptible. And susceptibility in functional medicine is really key. You know, if I shake everybody's hand, do we all get sick? No, some people are more susceptible to a cold than other people. But so then we have the fixed allergen. Yeah, you got a weakness towards something, but then you've been eating it all day long, every day, because they say the average person eats the same 25 foods day in and day out. You're like, ah, let me think about it. Is that true? Okay, potato, French fry, hash brown, baked potato, mashed potato, potato, potato. <laughs> And so it's like, oh, okay, mm, egg. I had egg. How many different ways? And so we eat the same 25 foods, rarely with the exception. Some people are more diverse eaters. So the goal is to identify a problematic food, minimize it. And if it's a low score, if it's in the one category, then once every four days, you can have it is a general rule. Assuming it's not an IgE food, a true allergy. And then you kind of measure your symptoms. And there's a general rule, 80-20 rule. You and I know this rule well. If we were to tidy up our office, we're going to get ready for patients, but we've been doing paperwork all weekend. And it's like, okay, I'm going to make it presentable. Yeah, shove things in the drawers, file them away. But now if somebody's going to come with a white glove and check every drawer for dust, that last 20% of cleaning is going to take 80% more effort. So I tell my patients, meet the spirit of these tools. These tests are tools. And you never want them to be a nemesis because you can have a shovel in your shed, but if all of a sudden you keep on smashing your foot with it, it becomes a weapon against you opposed to a tool to help you. And I know I sound very philosophical, but over the years, I realized finding that balance point. Now, if a person's really direly ill and they're miserable, they can't function, and they're basically like Lazarus re resurrecting themselves from the dead, um, then it's like, okay, yeah, we're going to be really strict for a while. But so we got the fixed ones. But you don't know what fixed ones are until you retest and you've avoided the foods for a while. Like, oh, those scores became lower, but they're still there. So they're inherently a weakness for you. So you're not going to play soccer with the 10-year-olds because the 10-year-olds are going to win and your knee's going to act up. But then there's a cross reactions. And that's why pollen.com and looking at your environmental pollens or not consuming an herb or a spice that is going to trigger you because we use them medicinally. We use them also, of course, to spice up our foods. And so we want to just be aware of those. And that's why the 2-8 panel is the way I go, because it measures all these different herbs, including hemp, which, of course, when you think hemp, then we think CBD, and then we start thinking, but I was doing CBD. I just didn't feel very well on it. Well, could it have been a hemp cross-reaction? Or you may be going um, vegan, and you're going for hemp protein or pea protein. Boy, I did went all healthy. I gave up the whey protein, but lo and behold, now I'm doing another protein. And that's sneaking up into your life. So always listening to your body and a babbling brook versus a stagnant pond. I love it, Dr. Miletus. That's so, so helpful for our listeners in terms of how they can implement some of these tools in their life. In addition to the testing, as you're saying, I think there's that famous quote and you did a great uh, analogy of it already similar, but if everything you, if the only thing you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So we always want to uh, come at, at, at different conditions and symptoms from multiple different approaches so that we can get the best outcome. Now, Dr. Melius, lastly, let's talk a little bit about detoxification. You've mentioned this a couple of times, but because with all of the chemicals and possible allergens we discussed today, we know that that this can be very hard on the organs in the body. And this is where detoxification is so important. But when most people hear the word detox, I think they usually think of those green juice drinks that you see everybody mm -hmm. drinking nowadays. And I think some people like to drink them and enjoy them. And other people pretend that they like to drink them because they think they taste horrible, uh, which is pretty funny. Um, but 
there's a lot more to detoxification, right? We know that the word detox is also even kind of a misnomer because every single moment of our lives, our bodies are detoxing. Mm -hmm. And we have a few different routes of toxin elimination in the body. We have our lungs, we have our kidneys, we have our skin, and we have our liver, as you've talked about a little bit, among many others. So can you dive into how all these areas of the body that are important for proper removal of these toxins, these allergens that are in our environment, um, and some of the ways that people can improve or enhance those pathways. Well, certainly. So the first thing, of course, is avoidance of additional burden. So that's where you clean up your environment. Because if we stop adding to the bucket, all of a sudden the bucket is going to be easier to drain. We keep on adding. So, of course, avoidance. Read the labels, avoid the plastics, avoid the parabens, um, get fresh air, get an air filtration unit. Um, for your home office or um, office at work. Um, if you have a new car, of course, make sure you roll down the windows and all that good stuff. If you have allergies, um, of course, put your car and recirculate and keep your windows closed and wash your hair before you go to bed. Even me, washing my hair before going to bed helps with environmental allergies because whatever landed and went by my nose or my eyes landed on my head, so I washed the head. So easy for me to say, because it dries in 30 seconds. Um, so the skin, let's talk about the skin. Number one, largest organ in the body. Um, first off, we can deliver things transdermally, therapeutically, hormones is that, but also the chemicals go in this way. So avoid any chemicals, including going to a massage therapist where she or he uses paraben cream. I bring my own, literally, I bring my own cream to my massage therapist. And so I don't want to be getting that exposure. I also believe in a chlorine filter. Um, once again, chlorine and of course, fluoride, once again, we don't want transdermal absorption. And so we want to also sweat, infrared saunas, sweating. And then I'm a fan, and I know there's controversy on this. I like people to do a tepid shower afterwards to maybe wash some of those pollutants off opposed to having that toxic sweat with all those chemicals you're getting rid of reabsorb. It's like, well, if it can go out, it can go back in. And so that's one thing. Then the lungs, we deliver drugs through the skin. We deliver drugs through the lungs. So we know the lungs absorb. And you mentioned gasoline. You're at the gas station, you know, service station. Keep the windows rolled up. Okay, here's your card. Okay, I'm going back in. I keep it under, you know, and, you know, so all those little things are big. Um, also, just things like wildfires, um, benzene occurs from wildfires. So you're in a state where that has been hit for year after year after year with wildfires. Your benzene levels can be higher just from the combustion of the forest fires. And like, but I can't move states and I can't hold my breath because I seem to turn blue. And that's where your air filtration, keeping your car recirculate is important. Deep breaths are as important, but fresh air. So like I said, my little haven with my air filtration unit I, this air filtration is good for 2,000 square feet, and I've got 100 square feet, so I'm good to go. Um, and once again, having a good air filtration, good water filtration. If you're in an area with fluoride, fluoride is not necessarily good. It lowers IQ per the peer review medical literature. Iodine levels have dropped in the United States by 50%, and it lowers IQ as well. Low iodine levels, lower IQ. More fluoride in your water, lower IQ. Things can happen. Elections happen. And so people, you know, drive with high fluoride levels. And I said, oh, that must be a high fluoride person. Um, so then, of course, the liver. The liver, we you know, takes all the blood from our GI tract, goes to first pass. This is how we worry about drugs and drug metabolism. It's called first pass. You take an oral drug, lots of it goes through your liver. But then where does the liver filter, dump all of its conjugated hormones, the phthalates, the parabens, or horm and whatnot into our GI tract. Back to my babbling brook versus the stagnant pond. You don't want to keep those bowels moving, but the liver has that phase one and phase two de detox, which there's a whole list of nutrients which you need to have for both of those. If you have a toxin, so that gasoline you were mentioning, you go through phase one, there's an intermediary phase where it's even more toxic and you're going to make sure you can pass that hot potato through phase two and then out the exits of urine and stool and skin. That's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you for diving into that. And, and you touched on a couple of the different types of treatment options available. Uh, again, in, in addition to obviously avoidance of the food, but some of the things that we can mitigate uh, these allergens, these sensitivities, and also re proper removal from the body. 
Do you think that there's any difference in the future uh, for allergen treatment or what do you think the future really holds for, for allergen, allergen treatments? I think we have to fortify our mucous membranes. Um, our mucous membranes are overwhelmed because of the, the organic pollutants, the toluenes, the benzenes. We need to have moist mucous membranes so that we're better filter once again. If you think of chapped skin, and I put vinegar on, it's going to burn a lot more. So once again, well hydrated, we always say about once again, fluoride free in my personal opinion. Um, but then in addition to that, I think doing things like vitamin C and quercetin, and there's the um, enzyme called DAO, diamine oxidase, which actually helps break down histamine. And we've talked today about IgE, emergency foods, IgG, gradual foods, IgA for the mucous membranes. But then there's also histamine rich foods and histamine rich foods can be something quote unquote healthy like spinach or nuts or alcohol. I'm going to take that out of the healthy category for the sake of conversation and being recorded. Um, and so what we have is we have all of these histamine foods. So if you're doing your food sensitivities, you notice that you're getting a little itchy, you're detoxifying, make sure you're not eating a histamine rich foods and on the nature of foods. We're all very familiar with the EWG.org, environmentalworkinggroup.org. Every year they come out with a dirty dozen foods and the 15 clean. We all are on budgets. So if you're eating animal products, they need to be free range, organic and humanely treated, of course. But in addition, spinach and strawberries are neck and neck for being toxic relative to highly herbicide and pesticide crops. And I became a victim as knowledgeable as I think I am. I shouldn't be my own doctor because I was eating spinach every day for like, it's like kind of a creature of habit. And I started getting itchy. Also if eating lots of nuts or seeds. They're also high in histamine. Also smoke, smoke foods, cured foods, and things even as healthy as kombucha, fermented foods. Of course, beer will be exempted, right? Wink, wink. No, it's not exempted either. And so it's like, okay, well, so look at histamine rich foods as well. And so just realize the goal is 80-20 rule. Just make life more sustainable, more healthy, but hydration, good bowel movements, sweating, body in motion, keep the lymphatics going. And then using things like vitamin C and quercetin or whatever your doctor or healthcare provider recommends for you is good to mitigate those histamine releases and burdens and rotate your foods. Um, we have the advantage, as I wrap up on my thoughts, of overfed, undernourished society. But year round, I can go ahead and get my favorite fruit, pomegranate. And rarely can I not get pomegranate. That's unnatural, bottom line, unnatural. Salads, kind of unnatural. Let's say I had a greenhouse, but I eat a salad every day of my life. But during the summer, I could get salads, but pomegranate had a salad during the winter. Welcome to modern concepts. And you started very wise at the very beginning. What about genetically modified foods? Once again, what I, we term Franken foods. Never been in human history before. And when you can get a tomato, which is blended with a flounder, a, fa a flounder fish, and it's now frost resistant. I don't think that tomato's genes was supposed to be mixed with a fish. And if it was, you can be the guinea pig to try it out and let me know how it works. Because uh, this doesn't make good sense to me. Dr. Moonis, I love it. It's, uh, balance is key. And as you mentioned, seasonality is so important. Eating what's in season, what's in your geographic territory can also help uh, a lot of these things for, for people suffering with different allergens in their environment. Dr. Moonis, this has been so nice to have you on the show today. I have one last question for you. And that is if you could give one tip to someone listening with allergy issues, whether that is from foods, whether that is from pet dander, whether that is from a plastics, whatever they might be suffering from that they might also not know, what would that be? Continue to play detective because the variables out there that's causing you to have the symptoms. So play detective and don't give up because you have the answer. And we know as healthcare providers in functional medicine, that usually the patient gives us the answer during the visit. They, they kind of know but they didn't know that that was the pearl. So pay attention to the variables, track your symptoms. And like you said, rotate the foods. Very, very important. Stay well hydrated. Make sure the babbling brook is happening and don't give up because the answer is available. 
Dr. Melendez, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. You did a really great job of educating everyone on the different types of allergens all around us, but most importantly, what we can do to actually start reducing that burden and improving our health. So thank you again for your insight. And for everyone listening, Dr. Melendez' contact will be in the show notes, but Dr. Melendez, please let everybody know again where they can find you. Well, certainly in Oregon. Um, no, actually, so uh, drmelitas.com or divine medicine, D-I-V-I-N-E medicine.com. I'm an educator for U.S. Biotech, and a lot of my webinars are available also at Rupa as well. And so I would say just let's go ahead and let's learn together. And then what you learn as an audience and as healthcare providers, let's share with everybody because we are the wellness change. We can pursue disease and disease chasing, but wellness is where we all want to be. Dr. Miletus, thank you so much again, and we'll talk with you next time. Hey, thank you.